All right, welcome back to chapter 34. Where we'll be talking about chest trauma. Today we're going to go over the anatomy of the chest, general categories of chest injuries, specific chest injuries, assessment-based approach, chest trauma, and then a summary and assessment and care for chest trauma. All right, our case study introduction, EMTs, Roxanne Freeman and Laura Cahill are on the scene of a patient who was ejected from the driver's seat of a vehicle that rolled multiple times after leaving the roadway at a high speed. As Roxanne maintains inline stabilization of the spine, while opening the airway with a jaw thrust maneuver, Laura quickly exposes the chest and listens for breath sounds. No breath sounds on the right. There is jugular vein distension, says Laura. What injuries are suggested by the mechanism of injury and the EMT's findings so far? What immediate interventions are required? Now, remember, you can pause, write these questions down so that you can go back and answer them in the future as we go over this lesson, and you can always pause and, and fast forward and rewind. All right, our introduction. Chest injuries may not have a dramatic appearance and can be overlooked. Chest injuries can be lethal. Always maintain a high index of suspicion based on the mechanism of injury. Okay, review of the anatomy of the chest. It is also known that the thoracic cavity is bordered inferiorly by the diaphragm. That means the diaphragm is underneath the thoracic cavity. Uh, we need to know what inferior and superior mean. It contains vital organs. The thoracic cavity is lined by two layers of pleura. All right, here's a good picture of it. The chest cavity, we see the trachea in the front behind the esophagus, the sternum, which is the bones are not colored in, but you can see the outlines. Okay. Um, then there's the ribs, intercostal muscles, diaphragm, the stomach, the lungs, the clavicle, heart and major blood vessels, and obviously the esophagus in the back of the trachea basic anatomy of the, of the uh, thoracic cavity and how it's set up. Obviously this stomach is the abdominal cavity but it's just giving you a reference. Okay, normal and negative pressure acts like a vacuum holding the visceral pleura that covers the lung to the per parietal pleura that lines the chest wall and keeping the lung expanded. When either the lung and its visceral pleura are punctured or the chest wall and its parietal pleura are punctured air enters the space between the pleura creating positive pressure on the lungs and causing it to collapse. So if we look down at the, uh, the lung, you see the parietal pleura here, the visceral pleura, your lung, chest wall. Then we have the, non, uh, the potential space right here, the, the pleural, the diaphragm. The visceral pleura that surrounds the lungs, the parietal pleura that surrounds the inside of that chest cavity. Outside air enters here through a penetration, um, penetrates that parietal pleura and puts pressure, adds pressure on that lung and it collapses and ruptures. All right. General categories of chest injuries. Open chest injury is caused by a penetration injury. Cavitation occurs with gunshot wounds because of the centrifugal force of the round entering the body. Um, it could cause a bigger uh, area of damage known as a cavity. If one of the great vessels in the chest is injured, it can result in immediate death. Okay. A pellet. Here we're looking at the pictures here. The, as a pellet fired from an air gun that creates an extremely small entrance wound. Although a pellet wound may be very small, a pellet can penetrate the thoracic cavity, ricochet around, and potentially cause lethal injuries. When you suspect trauma, you must expose and closely inspect the chest to avoid missing potentially lethal injuries. Doesn't look that bad. We can't even really tell from the outside if the pellet went in or not, but we have to assume with our high index of suspicion. Open chest injuries may involve injury of the heart major and major blood vessels. 
may include uh, a pneumothorax, which we've already talked about in the anatomy and physiology. Uh, penetrating trauma can interfere with the negative pressure needed for inhalation by allowing air to enter through the wound. And if you hear what sounds like chewing, that would be my dog. A closed chest injury. Closed chest injury results from blunt trauma. Uh, it can injure the heart, lung, great vessels, and other structures. Um, flail chest results when two or more adjacent ribs are each fractured in two or more places. Flail segment results when two or more adjacent ribs are, e are each fractured in two or more places, creating a segment of the rib cage that is not attached to the rest of the rib cage. Excuse me, the flail segment interferes with chest expansion and changes the interthoracic pressure. So as we see here, two or more ribs are broken in two or more places. So whenever you inhale, um, those uh, the, the pressure will change for those broken ribs here, and they will sink in as the rest of the chest cavity expands out. Uh, a flail segment, the, the effects of pressure during inhalation and exhalation explain why paradoxal movement happens. Paradoxal movement is simply movement in the opposite direction. And they're showing you paradoxal movement here. Inhale, chest expands, flail segment moves oppositely. Uh, exhalation, the chest um, shrinks, the chest cavity shrinks, and the flail segment expands, moves in the opposite direction. All right, normal versus paradoxical movement uh, caused by flail segment. You see in figure A, normal inhalation, figure B, normal exhalation. Got to pay attention, doesn't look that much different. Uh, figure C, see the flail segment drawn inward as the rest of the lung expands with inhalation. Right here, because that broken ribs are right here, so it's drawing it in. And figure D, the flail segment pushes outward as the rest of the lung contracts. You can see right here, pushing out. So the lung chest cavity contracts, and that just it just really stays there, but it looks like it's pushing out. To avoid further compromise of chest movement, do not place the patient on their injured side and do not stabilize the chest wall with objects that restrict chest wall motion. Consider CPAP if patient demonstrates signs of respiratory distress. And we know what CPAP is, continuous positive airway pressure. All right, pulmonary contusion. We know that contusions uh, are bruising. Um, bleeding occurs in the lung tissue. Excuse me, bleeding occurs in the lung tissue in and around the alveoli and in the interstitial space. Gas exchange is severely impaired, leading to severe hypoxia. You have to be thinking about what gas exchange is from anatomy and physiology, uh, where that the, the oxygen is picked up in the bloodstream by uh, from the alveoli and carbon dioxide is dumped off into the alveoli for exhalation. You have to think about and understand what gas exchange means. Uh, a patient who has suffered a direct blow or, or, an, or other blunt trauma to the chest may have a pulmonary contusion. And here we go. When the lung is bruised, which is a pulmonary contusion, there's bleeding into and around the alveoli and the space between the alveoli and the capillaries greatly reducing the exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide in the affected area. So we look at the bruise, the contusion to the lung right here. You see my cursor. They've blown it up for you. So they have the capillaries where you see the little platelets going through with that oxygenated blood. And then there is uh, the blood vessels inside between there have busted and causing uh, uh, blood to spill out into the alveoli sacs, which is bad, or the alveolus, which is bad because... There should be nothing but air and carbon dioxide moving in and out of those uh, spaces. So when we have that blood uh, fill up in there, then it's blocking the gas exchange from the capillary to the alveolus, which is a bad thing, which is going to cause hypoxia. All right, specific chest injuries.
Pneumothorax is an accumulation of air in the pleural space resulting in collapse of a portion of the lung. Causes, uh, it causes a paper bag effect um, it may, that may occur upon compression of the chest. So imagine blowing up a paper bag, a little paper bag you get from a convenience store, and popping it or um, popping that, uh, that bubble wrap that comes, that big bubble wrap that comes in uh, the Amazon packaging. Because I know you all ordered from Amazon Prime before. Um, so just thinking that pop, that rupture. Um, it also comes from uh, penetrating trauma and spont a spontaneous pneumothorax. A spontaneous pneumothorax is, is a, uh, still a pneumothorax. is a collapse of the lung or a rupture of the lung, causing that air into the pleural space. But it is usually done by, um, you know, activity, athleticism. Um, it's more common in, in, in young adult males um, that are really tall and that are athletic. Okay, an open pneumothorax is caused by an open chest wound that allows air to enter the pleural space with, in, with inspiration. So they're inhaling, and it, now that air is, in, is entering that pleural space um, because there is a hole in the lung. The open wound must immediately be occluded. Uh, well, let me, let, me, let me rewind that a little bit. Got a little confused there. So they're talking about an open chest wound that you can see, okay, um, on the outside. Uh, which we would call a sucking chest wound because it's it's going to burp and fart and bubble. So um, best first thing you're going to do is uh, they, they say it must be immediately occluded, means blocked off. Occluded means blocked off. So you would take a gloved hand first and place it over that hole um, and see if you can stop that air from moving in and out, which you would be able to. And before you put an occlusive dressing on there like it's telling you to do, you're going to need to wipe all that blood and, and fluid off of there because if you don't, then your occlusive dressing is not going to stick. So um, think about that. Okay, so you just take a little 4x4 four four piece of gauze or a couple of them, depending on how much uh, blood or whatever's on there, and wipe it off. Okay, um, open pneumothorax is a possible complication for chest injury, obviously. Um, so we have that um, air entering that sucking chest wound right there, and it's collapsed this lung, not necessarily ruptured it like I told you earlier, so that was wrong. Um, but it's collapsed this lung right here, and all this area is filling up with space. I mean, excuse me, air. All this space is filling up with air, and it's putting pressure on that lung. Um, so as air enters the chest cavity through an open chest wound or leaks from the lacerated lung, the lung cannot expand. So it can be from an open chest wound, but also a pneumothorax can be from the paper bag effect where the lung itself ruptures, and when you breathe in, it fills up the pleural space. So... Um, it can be from both, not just an open chest wound, but it was just telling, it was trying to give you that as an example. Okay, tension pneumothorax. I know some people say attention pneumothorax doesn't mean stand at attention. It means a tension pneumothorax, three different words, but we'll say tension pneumothorax is immediately life threatening. Air accumulates in the pleural space with no route of escape, increasing pressure in the thoracic cavity. Um, so before it becomes tension pneumothorax, it has to be a pneumothorax first. Um, it could be quickly a pneumothorax and then right to a tension pneumothorax, but there was a pneumothorax before tension pneumothorax, and we're going to get into that. Uh, the lungs, heart, and large veins are compressed, leading to poor cardiac output and hypotension, poor ventilation and oxygenation, and severe hypoxia. So, here we go. Tension pneumothorax. Collapsed lung, whether it is an open wound or uh, a rupture in the lung itself. Now, you look at this lung, this space right here, this pleural space has gotten a lot bigger so this area right here is starting to push over on to that heart muscle and then it's also pushing that lung over as well so it's giving that lung less space on the left side and uh, eventually if you um, don't do, take care of this this trachea is going to start deviating to that left side as well if it's on the right side if it's on the left side it's going to push it in the opposite direction obviously so um, you need to know your anatomy and what size of the body you're looking at. Okay, if we're looking here, we're looking at the patient's right side. I know that's on your left looking at it, but it's the patient's right side. This is the patient's left side. Okay, so either way, it could happen on either side. It's just showing you that it's on the patient's right side and pushing it to the left. So we don't want that tension to be pushed on the, car, on the heart because what's going to happen? Um, poor cardiac output because it's pushing pressure on those ventricles and they're not able to pump and fill up enough. And then uh, 
hypotension is going to occur, okay, because there's not enough blood to create enough blood pressure, okay, and then if, if enough oxygenated blood doesn't get to the lungs um, or to the body, we're going to have hypoxia, okay. All right, a hemothorax is blood in the pleural space that compresses the lung. It may occur in open and closed injuries, and the blood is blood loss can result in shock. Um, so, um, before I go to signs and symptoms, a hemothorax is like a pneumothorax, except it's involving blood in the pleural space. But also, the the one thing you're going to look for, other than a pneumothorax, is that that blood loss, even though it's internal, can cause the patient to go in shock. Because remember, blood needs to go around and around in our blood vessels and not anywhere else. Okay. So signs and symptoms of a hemothorax are going to be severe respiratory distress, signs of shock, absent breath sounds on one side. Okay, just like a pneumothorax, blood in that pleural space, collapsing that lung, compressing that lung. This could turn into a tension hemothorax as well because it can push over just like a tension pneumothorax could. Okay, but you need to be looking for signs of shock and one telltale sign of shock is skin condition. Okay, don't ever, don't ever discount skin condition as a vital sign. Okay, traumatic asphyxia, traumatic asphyxia, the sudden severe compression of the thorax causes a rapid increase in intrathoracic pressure. There is a backflow of blood out of the right ventricle into the upper body. Boom, that chest wall is being squeezed. Okay, severe chest compression puts pressure on heart and forces blood back into the vein of the neck. It may cause severe lung damage. One thing you're going to see with this is probably jugular vein distension. Because that vein in your neck is called the jugular vein. And I know we've talked about jugular vein distension, but if you don't know what that looks like, you need to go Google a picture of it. All right, cardiac contusion. Obviously, cardiac meaning heart, contusion meaning bruise. So a bruise of the heart is associated with blunt trauma from violent compression of the chest. A bruise to the heart wall may form or the heart may rupture. I don't know why it says may ruptured, but it may rupture. Uh, disruption in electrical conduction may occur. This could send your patient into cardiac arrest where you will have to do CPR and apply an AED. Commodio cordis is sudden cardiac arrest from blunt force to the pericardial area. A blow to the chest during a vulnerable period of the cardiac cycle can lead to lethal dysrhythmia. Dysrhythmia is any rhythm uh, that is abnormal uh, than your normal sinus rhythm of the heart. So a lethal dysrhythmia, one of them is called asystole. So um, we all know what that is. Um, for you who, those of you who have forgotten, that means uh, flatline. Okay? Start CPR and apply the AD immediately. Pericardial tamponade, or some people say tamponade. I really don't care how you pronounce it. You say it either way, people are going to understand what it means. <clears throat> it is bleeding into the fibrous sac around the heart from blunt or penetrating trauma. Okay, As there's that pericardial sac that surrounds the heart which fills up with blood and it doesn't go anywhere and then it compresses uh, causes compression of the ventricles which results in inadequate ventricular filling and reduced cardiac output. Some signs and symptoms of pericardial tamponade are jugular vein distension, uh, signs of shock because of bleeding, tachycardia and decreased blood pressure, narrow pulse pressure and weak pulses, and radial pulse diminishes on inhalation because when we inhale we put pressure in that thoracic cavity which puts pressure on the heart especially if it's already full that sac is already filled with blood so it's putting pressure and that it's going to slow that pulse or almost diminish it okay rib injuries the fractured rib may cause damage to the lung or intercostal vessels rib fracture is less common in children Signs and symptoms of rib injury include pain with movement and breathing, crepitation, tenderness upon palpation, chest wall deformity, inability to breathe deeply, coughing, and tachypnea. There we go. That would be a flail segment because it is, and 
two or more ribs broken in two or more places. Okay. Click on the injury that is characterized by air trapped in the pleural space under pressure, resulting in the compression of the structures of the affected side, mediastinum, and opposite side of the chest. I'll give you a few seconds to look at that. Okay, if you chose tension pneumothorax, you would be correct. A tension pneumothorax, see A tension pneumothorax, occurs with either an open or closed chest injury in which air accumulates in the pleural space and cannot escape. Pressure in the chest increases, compressing the structures within the chest. All right. Your assessment-based approach. What are you going to be doing whenever you get there on scene? Scene size up. Remember, we want to make sure we are safe. Um, if violence was involved, be especially careful with the scene size up, meaning do not walk into a scene that is still violent or volatile, where there's perpetrators still on scene trying to hurt people. Do not enter a scene that is not safe to enter and use standard precautions. So if, there, if it is a crime scene, you got to make sure you uh, maintain that crime scene to the best of your ability. And follow the, the police officer's directions, please. Um, I know that, oh, he's a cop and I'm not. and You might not like cops, and that's okay, but um, that's their scene, technically. And uh, they want you to be in there treating your patient because they don't know how to do it. Okay, so you got to work together. Whether you like them or not, you got to work together, and you got to respect them just like they're going to respect you. All right. Uh, during your scene, size of chest trauma, look for mechanisms of injury during sporting accidents like, you know, breaks, dislocations, sprains, strains, that sort of thing. Falls, fights, gunshot, vehicle collisions, crushing injuries, explosions. All right, in your primary assessment, you need to use spinal stabilization if it's indicated. If you have a trauma patient that you don't know what happened and they're unresponsive, you better use spinal immobilization or spinal stabilization. Uh, form a general impression. Is there the impression of your patient good or poor? Uh, expose and examine the chest. You should be doing that at, at, during your ABCs. A, get that airway. B, breathing. How am I going to look at the chest and see if it's uh, going up and down? I need to expose it. So I will expose that chest, see if I get good chest rise and fall. And at that point in time, I should be able to examine the chest quickly to see if there's any injuries as well. Assess the mental status. Are they unresponsive? Use ABPU. Are they alert? They only respond to verbal. Uh, they only respond to painful, or are they just completely unresponsive? Okay. Assess the airway. If you don't have an airway, you have nothing. If you do not have an airway, you have nothing. Look for signs of respiratory distress, which will be respiratory rate and quality, um, hypoxia, pale, cool, and clammy skin, that sort of thing. Okay. Primary assessment, if breathing is adequate, apply oxygen as needed to maintain the SpO2 greater than or equal to 94%. Consider CPAP for flail segment or pulmonary contusion. Remember that pulmonary contusion, that's where that blood is filling up in those, in those alveoli, and we want to use that CPAP to push that fluid out. Okay. Do not use CPAP if pneumothorax is suspected because there's already air going into the pleural space. We don't want to continuously put positive air pressure in the plural space. It's going to make it a whole lot worse. Um, if breathing is inadequate, provide positive pressure ventilation. Tension pneumothorax results in increasing difficulty in ventilating the patient because it is starting to compress and move everything in the thoracic cavity and the air will not go down the trachea like you want it to. And also that lung is probably collapsed, obviously, and um, it will not fill with air like you want it to. Cyanosis is an indicator of poor oxygenation and ventilation. All right, primary assessment. Pollard can indicate early hypoxia, poor pumping function of the heart, or blood loss. Look for that blotching of the skin. A weak, rapid pulse can indicate bleeding or compression of the heart. Chest injury patients are a high priority for transport. Now, I'm going to tell you, uh, to relieve a needle, um, a tension pneumothorax in the field, um, in the field, you're going to have to do a needle decompression, which is outside of your step, your scope of practice. So please, I don't care if you go on YouTube and learn how to do a needle decompression of the chest. 
do not do it because it is outside of your scope of practice. If you want to learn how to do it, if you want to be able to do a needle decompression in the field legally, then you need to go to paramedic school and become a paramedic. I'm not trying to be mean. I'm just trying to stop you from getting in trouble. All right, chest injury patients are a high priority for transport, always. Uh, during your secondary assessment, perform a rapid secondary assessment. Don't just caught, get caught up in the um, in the injury on the chest. Look at the rest of the body. You might miss a bleed down there or something. You might miss a, miss a broken leg that needs to be splinted, uh, which you can do in transport, but you still need to be able to look at that stuff. You know, Are there any impalements anywhere? Just don't get caught up on one thing. Do a rapid secondary assessment. Look at your patient. Make sure you don't get caught off guard. Assess the neck for subcutaneous emphysema, which is that bluing under the skin if it got if that blood got pushed back into the body. Uh, look for jugular vein distension and tracheal deviation. Remember, tracheal deviation is that pushing to the left or right, depending on which side the tension pneumothorax is. If indicated, apply a cervical collar after examination of the neck. Please don't put your C-collar on before you examine the neck. It's going to create a lot more work than you're going to be ready for. All right, expose the chest if not already done. Examine the lateral and posterior chest. It means the backs and the side, the back and the sides. Uh, immediately seal open chest wounds. For signs of flail signal with inadequate breathing, use positive pressure ventilation. Look for chest sym symmetry, paradoxical movement, swelling, deformities, crepitation, and guarding of injured ribs. Oscillate the lung sounds assess baseline vitals, and obtain a history. Look for cyanosis, signs and symptoms of uh, chest trauma, cyanosis, dyspnea, tachypnea, or bradypnea. Remember, tachypnea is fast breathing, bradypnea is slow. Obvious signs of injury, hemoptysis, signs of shock, and tracheal deviation. Paradoxical movement, open wounds, subcutaneous emphysema, jugular vein distension, absent or decreased breath sounds, pain at the site of the injury, especially with inhalation, failure of the chest to expand normally, weak or absent peripheral pulses, and a drop in the systolic blood pressure of greater than 10 millimeters of mercury on inhalation. Okay, your general emergency medical care for chest trauma, maintain an open airway, use inline spinal stabilization if indicated, Maintain adequate oxygenation. Reevaluate breathing status. Avoid forceful ventilation. All right, positive pressure ventilation here with supplemental oxygen. You see that oxygen tubing right here. It goes behind his head and it's hooked to the back of that bag. All right. Um, stabilize an impaled object in place. Please do not pull an object out or push an object in further to stabilize it. Unless it is compromising your airway. That is the only way we're going to pull it out is if it's compromising your airway. Stabilize it in place. Provide spine motion restriction if spinal injury is suspected and treat for shock. Open chest wound. Emergency medical care for open chest wound. Immediately seal the wound with a gloved hand. Clean off that chest area really, really quick. And apply an occlusive dressing. Continuously assess the respiratory status. Be alert to signs of developing tension pneumothorax. M emergency medical care for a flail segment. Do not splint the chest wall in any way that interferes with chest movement. Maintain oxygenation. Consider CPAP. Positive pressure ventilation if breathing is inadequate. Alright, she doesn't look too happy at all. So, uh, But they have a sling and a swab on her to stabilize her area of rib injury. So apparently she's got an injury on the right side, so they sling and swath her right arm to keep her from moving. Your reassessment. Be alert for signs of deterioration such as increased difficulty breathing, decreasing mental status, decreased breath sounds, worsening cyanosis, and shock. Reassess for missed injuries, interventions, and vital signs. Okay, in our case study conclusion, in the primary assessment, the EMTs find the patient responsive to pain with rapid shallow respirations and a weak rapid pulse that disappears on inspiration. Roxanne begins positive pressure ventilation as Laura requests ALS backup. With the assistance of other responders at the scene, the EMTs perform a rapid secondary assessment and package the patient for transport. The EMTs meet the ALS unit. At the agreed upon point, Roxanne reports that ventilations are very difficult. After a quick assessment, the paramedic performs a needle chest decompression. 
which immediately improves the patient's ventilatory status and circulation. The crew transport the patient to a trauma center where she undergoes surgery for chest and abdominal injuries as well as for multiple fractures. Our summary, chest injuries can lead to respiratory compromise, poor ventilation, and poor oxygenation. An open wound to the chest can allow air into the pleural space. A flail chest interferes with ventilation and oxygenation. Immediately cover an open chest wound with a gloved hand, followed by an occlusive dressing, which is taped down on three sides. Patients with flail chest or pulmonary contusion may require CPAP or positive pressure ventilation. Do not use CPAP for patients with a pneumothorax. All right, we'll see you next time.